Hello and welcome to Morning Coffee and Maestros. In today's episode, we'll be exploring and celebrating the unheard and often underprogrammed classical music of Mexico. So get ready for Cinco de Mexico as we discover five of the most influential composers from south of the border. And we are excited to add a new voice to today's conversation, our friend and incredible bassoonist, Fernando Traba. And we would love for you to join in in this conversation on both Facebook and YouTube. Let us know what, who are your favorite Mexican composers. Ask us any questions you have about the music or ask any questions you have about Fernando. You can do this by adding a comment on Facebook or using the live chat function on YouTube. And just for you, we've created a listening guide about these composers, complete with bios and YouTube links to hear some of the greatest compositions. You can click the link in the description below this video on YouTube or in the comments section in, on Facebook. You'll be able to download a document with all the pieces and the links we'll be discussing during today's show. And we are thrilled to have with us our friend Fernando Traba to help us learn more about classical music and composers of Mexico. But before we do that, let me tell you a little bit more about our special guest. Fernando Traba is principal bassoon of the Sarasota Orchestra and is a native of Mexico City, Mexico. He has served as principal bassoon with all five major orchestras in Mexico City, as well as the orchestra of the Principalities of Asturias in Oviedo, Spain, the National Opera Orchestra in Lisbon, Portugal, and Orchestra Sinfonica de Minería, close, right. close, right. in Mexico City. It's, it, if you know where that is, you'll do better than I am. I must confess early on that my Norwegian is great, but my Spanish is terrible. So. <laughs> Good luck. Fernando's going to try to help me. My black is good, but... Well, but see, my that's good. <laughs> so, my apologies to our Spanish brethren. Uh, Fernando has performed many of the major bassoon concertos with orchestras in Mexico, Europe, and the United States. He holds bachelor and master of music degrees from the Cleveland Institute of Music and has done postgraduate work at the Juilliard School. In addition to his orchestral duties, he has a private bassoon studio here in Sarasota, serves on the faculties of the University of South Florida in Tampa, and Florida Southern College in Lakeland, which means you drive a lot. Yes, actually, I am uh, like Mad Max. He's like <laughs> Mad I Max. I like you can just see him. He's got bassoons in the back seat, and he's just cranking, <laughs> cranking down 75 and I-4. So welcome, Fernando. It's great to have you with us. Well, thank you. I'm honored to be here. And, and uh, Joe, you have said basically everything. You haven't left anything else for me to say. <laughs> well, I think you have a lot to t say when it comes to Mexican composers and uh, all the stuff. Jamal and I were talking, we knew <laughs> almost none of these names. So you have um, told us so much about so many of these great composers and, and we're going to learn a lot today, which I think is the best part. But before we start, I know, um, if you don't know, Fernando, uh, his wife is Betsy Traba, who is the principal flute. So you have two musicians in the family and I'm just curious, how has uh, COVID-19 affected you and your family? Well, actually, it has affected us in good ways and not so good ways. I mean, uh, uh, good ways uh, is that uh, Betsy has actually had two or three rooms painted in the house. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I usually, I, I, I'm the painter and she tells me where to paint and, you know, we that do this. keeps you out of trouble that way. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, you don't weigh in and say, I think it should be lighter, it should be darker. No, no, no. I, I just said, just choose the color. I'll, I'll do it, you know. And in, in not so good ways, I mean, it's just, you know, that, that saying that when you love someone, if you really so, uh, love someone, uh, you let the person go. And if the person come back, you know, then it's, it's true love, you know. And in that sense, this COVID has shown me how much I love music, Betsy as well, because it's like not being, we, you know, we said, free and the COVID came and we haven't been with music, playing music and, and you find out how much you love playing and, and you know, entertaining audiences. It's true. I know when this happened, um, you know, if you know about orchestra musicians and, and conductors and singers, we have our season compressed like November to April 1st and it's just a mad dash. And when COVID happened, we started shutting things down. We were right at the very kind of the height of that. And I know the first couple of weeks of, of closing things down, I was kind of like okay with it. I'm like, oh, I can finally rest, I can catch up, I can do some of the things. But after about three weeks you go, wow. And you, I think for all of us, we had the sense of learning in a way that maybe we didn't appreciate before how much music is the driving force in our lives, how powerful it is. And I think by not having the opportunity to participate as fully as we're used to, it's opened up a whole new appreciation that maybe we didn't have before. Not only that, too, that, that, that also live music provides something 
that you cannot get through, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, watching a, a concert on, on television. You're right. A lot of people say, you know, oh, I'll, I'll, sorry, I don't have to go to the concert. I, I can listen to it on a CD or I can listen online. Well, now that we've all been doing that for months, I think you say to yourself, there's something very um, surprisingly uh, magical about being in a room, listening to music together, being a part of that. Um, and even as an audience member, I don't think I really had a, a great appreciation for that because A, I'm not usually in the audience, but certainly um, being in the audience, there's something about experiencing that moment together that can never be created that's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Have you and Betsy found any new approaches to being able to perform in COVID-19 world? Um, yeah, um, uh, actually Betsy has done several recordings for, for church services and, and uh, we try to just keep us uh, uh, practicing and keep our chops alive for when we have to perform. Hmm. And, uh, but I have to say it's, it's, it's really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I obviously am not performing at any of the same level as you and, and, and Betsy, but um, even just having to perform a weekly service with no one in the room to <laughs> enjoy the music has definitely been um, hard. So I've been grateful that we've opened back up, but still, you know, only having 100 people in the room is, is definitely not the same as having, you know, a huge audience. Um, and our concert series drastically will change this year um, and how we can offer it, what kind of concerts we can do. Um, so, well, I want to, to ask you, Fernando, if you could share your personal journey with us and, and your musical story um, and about oh. how you came to the U.S. Uh, sure. Um, well, I mean, uh, for, for those of you who, who don't know me very well, uh, um, I came from Mexico and uh, my father was a bassoon player and that's how I chose to, to play the bassoon. Uh, the story is that uh, my father who himself was an immigrant uh, from Spain, he, he arrived in Mexico as a refugee from the Spanish Civil War in 1939, uh, was working with the National Symphony in Mexico, and they were on tour to Europe. Uh, I was two years old, and he went and tried to um, bought actually a bassoon for his two-year-old son. And uh, every year around my birthday, you know, he had it in a closet, and he would bring it down, open it, and I remember it was a beautiful case with with parrot green velvet in <laughs> So he opened the case and he was like, whoa, this beautiful instrument. And, you know, when I was six or seven, I said, you know, can, can, can I play it? Can I put it together and I can play? And he said, no, 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 you are too young. I think the bassoon <laughs> would be taller than you were. Exactly, you know, but I, I, I wanted, you know, he said, this is for you. So I said, well, can I play it? And he said, no, no, no. <laughs> so I had to wait until I was 11 years old. And actually the bassoon just was a little bit shorter than I was. Uh -huh. And um, so that's called brainwash. <laughs> and <laughs> He would have been so sad if he would have said, no, dad, I want to play the tr trombone. <laughs> Yeah, well, the thing is, I heard him play, and he would take me to concerts, and, and so it was like, to me, it was interesting. And uh, so later on, uh, within a year or so uh, of me starting to play the bassoon, I found out I was, I actually liked it, I was, you know, proficient, and, and uh, he, uh, we heard that they were going to form the first national youth orchestra hmm. in, in Mexico City. This was in, in 1975. And um, I remember my father said, you have to audition for this. And I was 13 years old. And we went and I memorized this piece that I played at my audition. And I got to be the principal bassoon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fast a rise, a fast rise there. That's pretty good. Yeah, and I remember the very first rehearsal we had with that orchestra. Even though we had gone to many concerts and I had been, to, my father was playing also with the opera orchestra in Mexico City, and I had, you know, 
Actually, I fell asleep in the front of the first one of the first offers. <laughs> <laughs> but um, having heard all of that, being there as a part of an orchestra and playing with other musicians felt so natural that I, hmm. at that point, I said, "This is what I'm going to do," and that's what I did. Well, and t right. tell us how you got. Uh, I know you wanted to go to the United States a little earlier than the family was willing. Oh, yes. Well, I, anyway, I got, uh, when I was 13, I got to be the principal in this National Youth Orchestra. And three years later, I actually auditioned for a real job for the orchestra of the, the, the university, which was a professional orchestra. And I got the job of contrabassoon player there. And I was 16. And there, I met this American bassoon player by the name of Neil McDonald. And at that time, my father had told me, Fernando, I've taught you everything I know. Mm. Basically, <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> 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 and so I met this American bassoonist, and, and he was playing really well. And I asked him if I could take lessons with him. And he said, sure. And so I started to go with him. And after, I don't know, after a month or so, he said, you know, Fernando, you really should go and study with my teacher. And he was a graduate from the Cleveland Institute of Music. And single-handedly, he basically did all the paperwork. And I remember I attended that, that year when I was 16. Uh, I went for the first time from Mexico City to Wisconsin to this summer music camp for high schoolers where this guy was a bassoon teacher. And I went there, and I was just mesmerized. But mm -hmm. one of the things that happened there was that the registrar from the Cleveland Institute of Music actually came with a big Betamax video oh. recorder. <laughs> <laughs> it was a humongous thing. Uh, and he recorded auditions for the Cleveland Institute of Music. So I remember I, I paid whatever it was at that time. It was 10 or $15, you know, and, and I auditioned. And lo and behold, back after a month or so, uh, when I was back in Mexico, I got the letter from the Cleveland Institute of Music that I had been accepted uh -huh. as a freshman for next year. And how old were you? And I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I told my parents I was so happy. And my parents said, you know what? I don't think you're going to be able to go. <laughs> they were concerned, of course, you know, I was 16. They said, oh, you know, there's so many dangers. You may fall into drugs, you know, you may become a drug addict or whatever. <laughs> you know, and I was like, you know, so I had to write to them. I said, I'm sorry, I, I can't go. So what I did, I worked and I saved money through a, for a couple of years. And in 1980, the Cleveland Orchestra came back, to, it came to Mexico and did a concert. And I asked the principal bassoonist, George Gosley, who was the teacher at CIM, uh, if I could play for him again. And he said, of course. So we, you know, we scheduled the, 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 the audition. I went to his hotel room. I went and played. I said, Fernando, you'll receive a notice from the school very soon. Hmm. And lo and behold, I received the note and they said, you are accepted. Wow. And of course, I, I left in January of 1981 and I arrived in Cleveland on a day that was so cold, so <laughs> gray, <laughs> and snowing that I had brought just a sweater right. from Mexico. And I was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> See? Careful what you wish for. Exactly. But, you know, and, and that was the regimen for the, for the whole of January. It was right. oh. gray, rainy, cold. <laughs> that sounds like Cleveland. Not great, you know. And I was like, okay. But that was the first time when I saw snow for the first time in my life. Oh, yeah. And that wow. was, I was actually on a, on a class taking an a, a ear training class. And then suddenly they had huge windows in the, in the building. And suddenly you see the, the snowflakes just falling very slowly. And I was like, oh, it was <laughs> incredible. I mean, I remember that experience. It was so, so great. 
anyway, so that's how I, I came to the, the CIM, and I did my bachelor's and master's there. And after that, I, I wanted to remain in the country for another year, see if I could get audition and get a job. And uh, so I auditioned to, for the advanced certificate program at Juilliard. And I, I drove there, auditioned, and they accepted me, and I stayed one more year in Juilliard. And after that, this uh, Portuguese uh, conductor, Alvaro Casuto, uh, arrived in Juilliard, and he was looking for, a, for a, basically a wind quintet mm. to fill all the principal wind positions of his orchestra in, in uh -huh. Portugal. It was a chamber orchestra. And so we auditioned, and we got the job, and off we, we, go. Off we go to Portugal. <laughs> and within six months, uh, this was an orchestra that would basically, we would rehearse a program and you know Mozart 40 whatever overture whatever and then we would take a bus and for the next three weeks we would go from oh, town to oh. town you know go to this town perform go to the hotel next morning bus arrive to the town perform hotel you know so after <laughs> After about six months of that, I got to know all of Portugal, bet, yeah. <laughs> north, <laughs> south, east, west. I mean, it's a gorgeous country, gorgeous Beautiful, country. Yeah. But, and that's also the reason why I can play probably Mozart 40 and many other symphonies by memory, just because we were like, you play boom, <laughs> boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. Wow. Uh, and after that, I saw that there was an, uh, um, an opening for principal bassoon in the National Opera in, in Portugal. In, in Lisbon, and I auditioned, got the job, and I stayed there for about a year and a half. And uh, my father, being from Spain, you know, I, I have, I still have a couple of family members in, in, in Madrid, you know, the, I, I heard that there was this new orchestra being formed in the, in the region of Asturias, which is in the north, mm -hmm. in the north of Spain. The capital of Asturias is the city of Oviedo. And basically, they were starting this new orchestra of 64 people, hmm. like from scratch. So they auditioned Spanish people first, and then they auditioned international musicians. And I remember living in Portugal, I had to fly to Amsterdam to audition for this job in Spain. Wow. <laughs> that I could have you could have driven. Just driven, right? Yes, yeah. I could have driven there, but they say, no, you're international, you have to go to Amsterdam. I said, okay. So I went to Amsterdam, I auditioned, I got the job. I was principal bassoon there for two years. And at the time, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Frank Cohen, who is the principal clarinet emeritus of the Cleveland Orchestra, came to visit. And he said, Fernando, you know, there is an opening in Sarasota. Because he comes here and teaches at the right. Sarasota Music Festival. and." I asked him, like, where is Sarasota? <laughs> he said, oh, it's, it's in Florida. You're going to love it. It's a beautiful city. It has a beautiful beach and everything. And I, I remember, OK, OK, so I'll try this. So I remember waking up like at 3 in the morning. I flew from Asturias to Madrid. And then at 6 AM, I took the plane from Madrid to JFK. Then JFK to, <laughs> to Sarasota. I arrived in Sarasota like at 3 p.m., which was like 9 p.m. my time. Right, right. And the audition was the next morning. Oh my. And uh, so I auditioned, and uh, I remember I was in the finals and, uh, with uh, uh, a colleague of mine that I had been to school with in, in New York. And he was like, oh man, I hate to be in this place. You know, we are competing, sure. you know, yep. basically for this for the only one job, and we have three of us here, you know? Uh, but that's how it was, and, and I got the job, and I've been here since, and uh, I, you know, I, I, I think many times how it is with life when you walk a path and suddenly life goes into two different directions, mm -hmm. and you're like, what should I do? I could have stayed in Spain for the rest of Certainly. my life, mm -hmm. and yet I came to the States, and who would know that I would make my wife and we would have two beautiful daughters and you know that i would get to live in this amazing community of mm. of art supporters <coughs> it's it's really amazing I, I i cannot 
tell you how lucky I feel. Oh. Well, we're, we're lucky to have you make sure so your home. So I remember when I was moving here uh, and finally moved here, you and Betsy were the first musicians in town I had ever met and played here for morning worship and then got to go get some barbecue and collard greens. Right. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. So you shared with both of us sort of about your father immigrating to Mexico from, Sp from Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about that? Oh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, my father, talking about, you know, immigration, my father uh, was born in 1913, which is, he passed away on, on, in the year 2000. But, but he was born in 1913, so I can tell that my grandmother, his mother, was born in 1874. Wow, Jesus. Yeah, she, she actually had my dad very late. She was 39 years old. And at that time, you know, having a, a, a child was not a security that that child would survive. Right. My father was, I think, number nine, wow. of which only three survived. Oh my goodness. Wow. So my father had a brother and a sister. The sister later, you know, she had cancer, it's a different story. But anyway, so my father was born in 1913, First World War came. Um, he was, because his father had died <laughs> in the pandemic of 1918 he right. was one of the casualties the, the spanish flu right you know my grandfather was one of the casualties so uh my my grandmother could not support these three kids so she actually sent the two boys to this sort of like orphanage kind of college and that's where they they grew up and that's where my father learned music uh, at some point they told him you know like what are you guys going to do? Either you go into music or you go to the, do the military service. And so Jeez. my father said, I'll go and do music. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he actually started, uh, he learned the clarinet. That was his first instrument. And then when he saw how many clarinet players there were, right. he said, there's no way I'm going to be able to make a living. So he actually learned the bassoon. Oh, that's interesting. And yeah. uh, he... He had odd jobs, and then the, the Spanish War, came, the Civil War came. He enrolled in the military as a military musician, and they had a military band. It was the, the, the fifth, re, el quinto regimiento, the fifth regiment, and um, he played for basically these battalions of people that would go and fight Franco, mm -hmm. who was at the time was the, the other, you know, uh, uh, and Franco was being helped by Hitler and by Mussolini. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is that huge uh, a painting from Pablo Picasso called Guernica, mm -hmm. which is, a, Guernica is a city where basically all the German uh, bombers dropped bombs and they killed, basically did away with the city. And, and that hurt a lot of Spaniards and that's why Picasso literally painted this humongous, incredible painting uh, but, but yeah, my father was there <coughs> and he survived and they were in Catalonia near Barcelona when, when they basically one of the, the last um, uh, 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 there, there, there was a uh, um, battle was lost and after that battle in Barcelona when Barcelona fell uh, they knew that their cause was so they basically went and, and, and moved into France. At that time, they say about 500,000 people mm -hmm. crossed into during that week or something like that into France. And the French, of course, uh, at that time, they labeled them as like not welcome immigrants so that they could basically uh, arrest them if they did you know, something. So they put all these people <coughs> in various uh, camps, which were on the beach in a, in a region there in France. It was called the, the, the Saint Cyprien. Mm -hmm. uh, there were several beaches there. And another one, it, it was called Le Barcares. Yeah, I know. And uh, my father said that they separated the women and children and the men. And the men mm -hmm. went, were in this beach. 
and it was freezing. It was like January or February of 1939. And uh, uh, they had to basically dig on the sand to spend the night, I mean, to keep warm. And many people would die, they would get typhus, they would get, mm -hmm. they, they would be sick. Some people went crazy and literally took off on onto the Mediterranean and they say, well, see you guys and kept walking, wow. you know. Uh, so my father, you know, but, but my <coughs> father survived. Uh, uh, there were barbed wire on the other side and they had these Senegalese wow. guards Guardsmen yeah. that mistreat all these people because there were a lot of them. Um, but my father survived, and then the Mexican government, uh, with some uh, society from Spanish relocation service or something, and the Quakers in England too, they paid for three ships to go to this place, pick up uh, refugees, and get them to Mexico. And in the, the ship that my father came, which uh, it was called the Sinaya, um, there were 1,600 people. Oh my and it was, it was very hard because everybody wanted to leave, you know, those, sure. those conditions. I mean, my father would say that they would give them a big baguette for 25 people. And oh that, my gosh. that was basically, you know, most of the food that they would get. But anyway, my father being a member of this musical band it was called at that time they had changed the members from the military just basically became a uh, uh, civil a civil organization and they called that band banda madrid mm. and so they say oh you guys are musicians come into the ship and they perform once actually sometimes even twice every day for the whole it was almost a month that took them to cross, to cross over, yeah. to cross over into Mexico. And I remember <coughs> that they were practicing the, the Mexican anthem. And when they arrived in Mexico, the Mexican president was there and they started to play the, oh, wow. yeah, the Mexican anthem and the, you know, people were teary and stuff like that. And, and, uh, uh, they literally just landed and, and they started their lives any way they could. You know, the, this band actually held together and they went to Mexico City and started to play, you know, at, at that time, the, 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 the owner of the brewery that makes the Modelo mm -hmm. beer <laughs> was also from Spain. And he would give them, you know, jobs to go and play and stuff, trying to support right. the Spanish refugees. Everybody that, that was in Mexico, you know, they found, of course, people that they didn't like them that they were there. You know, right. the, the, the people that would say that they would come to reconquer Mexico. But there were other people that were so very helpful mm. and, and, you know, supported the, the cause. And, and as I said, they, they, they were brilliant people, artists, scientists, uh, all kinds of different uh, um, talents that came with this immigration of, of Spanish people into Mexico. So my father came and, and just made his life and he became, uh, he started to play into radio shows at the nice. time where they used uh, live music. And uh, after that, uh, they, he became the, the uh, player with the National Symphony in Mexico. And later on, he became the principal bassoonist with the opera oh. in Mexico City. and. And that's how I, I came to be. Well, we have, um, so if some weeks ago, you know, we talked, we've been talking about classical music in general. Um, and I think so often we, we focus on the, the specific canon of, of classical repertoire um, that generally is all white European. Um, and so with Morning Maestros and Coffee, we've really been, or Morning Coffee and Maestros, sorry, let me get the name it's right. It's close enough. Right? <laughs> it's all the branding. we got to work right? on our branding. <laughs> we've, we've sort of been talking about how other cultures that are not white European have really influenced classical music, and, and especially here in America. But today we focus on some classical composers um, from Mexico. And so, Fernando, you chose five of them for us that we get to talk about today. And it was exciting to, to learn about them, do the research, and um, 
and hear a lot of their music. Uh, so for one, I apologize for butchering any names today. <laughs> um, Not at all. But I think you're going to do better than I'm going to. I could, I'm, a little, <laughs> I'm a little nervous. But who do, we, who do we start with first? Well, actually, um, we're going to start with, uh, what's his name? Manuel... Sumaya. Manuel de Sumaya, who was actually a Mexican-born composer. Uh, he was born in the late 1600s. And, and um, at that time, you know, Mexico was basically a land of different cultures, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the, the Mystics, the Toltecs, the, you know, all these different cultures. And then in 1521, the Spanish people came and basically, you know, tried to, to wipe out the local population and they took over and they created sort of like as they call it back then the new Spain wow. La Nueva España so they basically came to Mexico and and uh, yes of course they brought culture they brought a, a single uh, language which is Spanish which is you know they brought animals they brought cows which did not exist oh. in in the new world uh, uh, horses, uh, horses did exist, but, but they didn't, you know. Uh, so that created kind of an animosity of the, the local people towards the Spanish people. Mm. And that's what I was look, uh, alluding before with my father, mm -hmm. that even to this day, because in Mexico it is, you learn in history what happened during the conquest. So people sort of tend to, to uh, internalize and, and say, well, all Spanish people are horrible because they came and conquered Mexico, even though it happened, you know, 400 years ago. Hmm. Uh, and uh, so there is that part of the culture. And so when the Spanish people came, they literally established their culture, their everything. Uh, with the difference that they had to deal also with the local population. And so the people that came and wrote music uh, were basically the immigrants from Europe or the children of immigrants oh. of Europe. At that time, Mexico had a system of castes mm -hmm. and, um, and you were, depending on where, who your parents were, is where you were in society how high you could mm -hmm. uh, dream to go, it was based upon who were your parents. Right. If your parents both were from Europe, you were called a criollo. Mm. And that was a very, you know, you could do a, basically everything. If one of your parents was a local <laughs> and the other one was a European, then you were a mestizo. And so it was, you could not do certain things. You know, not being government, not be, mm -hmm. you know, it was very... Then, if both of your parents were locals, uh, you were basically just an Indian. And if you, if you had actually a parent that was from Europe and uh, another one that was an African-American, you were called a mulatto. Mm -hmm. And that was also, you know... It's the almost as if the color of your skin dictates exactly, yeah. exactly. Where, you, where you are in that system. Exactly. So basically everything that you hear about Baroque music in Mexico at the time was a music that was written by people either from Europe or people that were very wealthy and had learned from Europeans. So it was basically writing European style music mm -hmm. in Mexico. You know, some Sumaya being born there, you can s hear in the music a little bit. He tries to incorporate a little bit of the rhythms. Yeah, you can hear that the, in his music. You know, but but uh, to go as to say, you know, they were really trying to say, oh, let's let's stand out these uh, folk melodies from the natives here. You know, that was not there. Yeah, I, w I was amazed. The first time I heard music from that period was Chanticleer had a CD called in the 1990s. Uh, Mexican Baroque, and it had Sumaya on there and Naxio Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and I was just shocked at how the quality of that music was just 
um, on par with what would be happening mm. in Europe. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I imagine um, if you were in that cathedral in Mexico City, I mean, that was incredible music you were hearing mm. at oh, a time yeah. when uh, Mexico City was essentially the, the home of Baroque in the Western Hemisphere. Exactly. Well, well and that, that's the reason. And actually, uh, Manuel de Sumaya uh, went and got the job of Kapellmeister <laughs> right. of, of the, the, the cathedral in Mexico City. So basically, his job was writing all, all this music, and uh, he did so very well. And there's a, we have one of the link that we have on this one is a, a piece that I really, uh, really love. Um, and it's a, a fairly short piece. It's a lot of, uh, talks about really just praise and everything. And it's a very joyful piece. But I think when you listen to it, you won't say, oh, that's from Mexico. You'd never no, know it unless, you, couldn't, yeah. you know, it very much <laughs> has that European tradition. But yet the craftsmanship of it is really impressive. Yep, yep. So with, with, a lot of the other compo with the other composers we talk about today, we we really see the nationalistic theme of of their music in the times they were writing. Um, but I would say, coming out of the Baroque time, what is we see what's sort of characteristic about rhythmically about Mexican folk music, but I guess harmonically, what is what is characteristic about Mexican folk music? Well, at the time, folk music, Mexican folk music, you couldn't tell that it, it was harmonic. I mean, it was mm. just basically a simple, simple melodies, okay. you know. There was nothing, there was no, at that time, basically, it was, there was no complexity yeah. to, the, to, to the music, the native music. It was basically just rhythmic. And so, sort of melody going, but no, no, there, there was no, no, not a structure like the Western music from Europe. Yeah. And when we fast forward a little bit to our next composer, talk about harmony. Woo. Yeah, <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so our next composer, uh, and you're gonna get this. I'm gonna get this. You are. I can you tell. You are. Manuel <laughs> Maria Ponce. Oh, that was very good. Manuel was born in Agua Calientes in December 1882 and is what I would like to call the Mozart of Mexico. <laughs> uh, he was an extremely talented musician and composer by the time he was nine years old. And he wrote La Marcha del Saramp Sarampion, March of the Measles. Uh, he wrote this piece after having contracted the disease at nine years old. <laughs> so as a child, Manuel is, is like Mozart. I mean, just writing music and good music at that. And even music about measles. I mean, and music was... about measles. <laughs> I mean, as a child, Manuel <laughs> learned piano and solfege from his sister, Josefina and sang in the children's choir and played organ at his church of San, Di San Diego, where his older brother was the priest. I think that's one of the things that I'm seeing about so many of these composers, and even in your story, is just the beginning of, of music has been nurtured at home. Yeah. Yes. For yes. certain. Yep. Um, at the... And most of them will have a church connection. Yeah. You know, because at that time, basically in Mexico, the church was... You know. The end all be all. Yes. It was it was the government to <laughs> exactly exactly yeah. But but Manuel M. Ponce uh, definitely had that. You can hear it in his music. He he was one of these people that that just has the gift of melody, uh, like like you know like a Debussy or something mm -hmm. like that. That you know at some point somebody tried to to study with Debussy and and Debussy said, I just I cannot teach you how to do this because I, I just hear it, <laughs> right. you know? And with Manuel M. Ponce, it's, it's sort of like that same way. He just came with all these amazing, amazing uh, melodies. And these are melodies that if you, it's like uh, uh, the one aria that you have on here is just so stunning and the links, and it's, um, it's like a, a melody that Puccini would write. It's just that rich in harmony and that rich in melody and just amazing, amazing stuff. It, it reminds me one time, you know, uh, we were speaking with uh, David, Ma the composer, the mm -hmm. late composer, actually, he passed away a few years ago, David Maslanka, and we were having lunch with him because he had written a, a wind quintet for our quintet here in Sarasota. And 
Um, so I actually, I asked him, you know, do you think music will ever die? You know, people will lose interest in, in, in classical music. He said, you know, I don't think so. Because there will be always people that are born that are destined de hmm. yeah. to do something with it. Yeah. Well, at the age of 18, Ponce um, studied music at the National Conservatory in Mexico City. And unfortunately, he was not too enthralled with the music education he received there. So he went to study in Italy with Bologna, oh. um, but was rejected. Didn't oh. get the opportunity to study with him. <laughs> um, but fortunately, um, he had the opportunity to study with the... Uh, the g study with a pupil of the goddess, the god of all music, uh, Puccini, uh, before making the journey to study at the conservatory in Berlin, Germany. It was his time in Germany that I, that I could see really ignited a flame for incorporating Mexican folk elements in his music. Just like in Germany, they were showing such nationalistic pride um, and that came out in the influences of, of much of the German music so many of his colleagues that he studied with um, basically said to him hey you should be doing the same thing uh, with your music um, so with this newfound calling he returned to Mexico and taught piano and music history at the conservatory it was during this period he wrote Estrayeta, Estrayeta Ita, yep. Ita, uh, which is his most famous composition. Subsequently, because of the Civil War in Mexico, he would spend two years in Cuba and then finally return to Mexico. Um, so, Fernando, what one, what is so important um, about his music, and is he somewhat highly performed today or not so much? Well, uh, Ponce's music is, 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 besides its beauty, it's, it's, it's just, it's music that is written from the heart and uh, uh, has made Ponce actually a, a very beloved composer. Everybody in Mexico knows Manuel M. Ponce, you know, mm. it's, it's, they, they've heard either Estrellita or the Intermezzo or any, or uh, he has a, a guitar concerto. He has many, many pieces and, and, and uh, it was, I would say it's like, like the American composer Samuel Barber. Mm -hmm. yeah. But his output wasn't that great in, in numbers. Right. It was, but every piece was incredible. Hmm. Oh, I think so. I, the pieces that uh, uh, you picked for us for uh, the links are, are just two, I mean, if you could set aside six and a half minutes to have your life change and your heart full, it would be these two pieces. There's a performance of an intermezzo by Lang Lang on piano that is just, um, the piece itself is amazing, mm -hmm. but my God, this performance of that piece on top of it is yeah. special. And Very then special. this piece called Estre uh, Estrellita. Estrellita. Uh, Estrellita. Little Star Little is an star. aria, and I'm telling you, I think I've listened to that 20 times. It's so gorgeous, and I, do, I did not know the tenor, Alfredo Kraus, but... A uh, Spanish tenor, <laughs> yes. Wow, I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's like step aside, Placido, I'm telling you, this is, <laughs> no, this he was, is good stuff, they, my they, goodness. They called him, you know, he was from, uh, from the Can he was born in the Canary Islands, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they called him the Canary of Spain, Spain's Canary. Oh you my know? gosh, <laughs> well, it's, it's stunning, so I encourage you, Check that out. If you don't, if you listen to no other links, listen to those two, and then a couple other ones I'll talk about later. All right. So who's our next one, Fernando? Our next one will be Silvestre Revueltas. Yes, mm -hmm. Silvestre Revueltas is perhaps one of the the the, the most the well-known composers in Mexico because he he started this his writing of music was so forward-looking, and yet he was able to incorporate polyrhythmic hmm. and, and na you know, national tunes into it. Mm -hmm. And it's really, uh, listening to him is like listening to, to the music of Aaron Copland. Yeah. You know how music of Aaron Copland is identified with some sort of like American right. uh, national sense, mm -hmm. you know? And, and Silvestre Revuelta's music is in that same... Yeah. In fact, I think 
Aaron Copland went to Mexico at some point in the early 30s, and that's where he wrote his El Salon, Salon Mexico. Mexico. Yeah. And I believe there is a picture of Aaron Copland and Silvestre Revueltas with Carlos Chavez, who mm. was another Mexican, right. very famous uh, Mexican composer, together. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, Silvestre Revueltas died very young. Very he was young. 41. But he did a lot. He composed a lot. He was one of these people like, like uh, Francis Poulenc that had a, a gift for the melodies mm -hmm. that right. he would write very quickly. Yeah. And in fact, going back to my father in Spain, Silvestre Revueltas visited Spain during the Civil War. And, uh -huh. and uh, just he went to the Mexican uh, embassy there and, and uh, with a cultural attaché and everything, trying to help people there and uh no he was, he was fantastic. Made, i think what's um he wrote so many different pieces and he was late to composing he didn't start composing until he was really yes. in his 30s so he only had less than a decade to to write music and most of the the composition well not most but a lot of his compositions were compositions that he wrote for the film industry mm -hmm. at that time in mexico because of the the second world war it was starting and everything you know the Hollywood was not producing so many movies, so m the Mexican movie industry it, it went into overdrive. And that period in the 40s and 50s, it's called the golden mm -hmm. era of uh, Mexican cinema. And he wrote a lot of the, the, the background music for many, many of the, the, the movies. In fact, there is a, a piece of him called La Noche de los Mayas, the, the night of the Mayan people mm -hmm. that was basically made for a movie of that title and, and, and it's just, it's incredible. It's I, I had found one little quote that I loved. They were asking him about incorporating nationalistic um, styles in his music and he said, why should I put on boots and climb mountains for Mexican folklore if I have the spirit of Mexico deep within me? Hmm. And I think he did, yeah. you know, I, I, we probably should just mention Sense of Maya because it's such a yeah, uh, Sensei Maya is, is supposed to be uh, a, one of his uh, masterpieces. And it's, it's Sensei Maya is, is uh, basically the dance uh, to how to kill uh, a uh, serpent, hmm. a snake, how to kill a snake. And it's based on, on a poem by the, the Cuban poet Nicolas Guillén. And in that poem, Nicolas Guillén cites uh, this folklore from Cuba where they do this ceremony to try to kill the snake where they keep repeating Mayombe, Bombe, Mayombe Mayombe, Bombe, Mayombe and that's the rhythm that you will and find in Saint yeah. Semaya okay. -dum, bum, bum, yeah, bum, throughout, pop, yeah. it's, he gets it so well it's such a great piece so I hope that you'll I hope that you'll listen to that one because it's such a it's such an iconic piece, and I love the way it starts. When you think about the serpent, it's all the low instruments in the orchestra, and it just, it, the minute it starts, it's really unusual yes. and, and just deeply captivating. Oh, and, the, and the, the, there's a, a lot of polyrhythm in that, mm -hmm. and the, the, yep. the harmonies and everything. It was so, I mean, incredible. So we did a top five list, and we had a problem because we needed six. But we wanted to go Cinco de Mayo, so we decided. Uh, so we we decided that what we do if we're going Cinco de Mexico, we're going to have a loophole because all the composers we've talked about so far, they're all born in Mexico. That's right. But this next one was not born in Mexico, but we have to include him because he taught so many of the next generations to follow. So we decided that we're going to go. This is three B. <laughs> this is three B. So it's Rodolfo Hafter and. Um, um, so he is 3B, our loophole composer. Yes. He was born in Madrid. He was self-taught. Um, he was a uh, as a composer, he was part of a, a group of uh, a composer society called a Grupo de las Ocho, the the group of, no, Ma of, of Madrid. Eight. The, yeah, group the group of, of eight. eight. And yeah. they were in uh, Madrid. And uh, this group was influenced by the Spanish musician Adolfo Salazar, who encouraged them to innovate and introduce them to all this incredible avant-garde music of the time. And during this time that he was part of that group, that was when most of his significant compositions were, were written. And um, at the same time, he was writing this wonderful music, but he was also a music critic, as well as a propaganda ministry 
uh, mm -hmm. in the propaganda ministry of the Republican government. Yes. And because of that, yes. um, he went into exile into Mexico at yes. the end of the Spanish Civil War, as we've been talking, and became a citizen in, in uh, Mexican citizen in 1939. 1939. He actually, I, I don't know if he arrived in Mexico in the ship that my father arrived, but, or one of the other two. It's very, uh, the time it is. But, you know, he was born in 1900. So when he arrived in Mexico, he was 39 and uh, already had a career in Spain. And like a lot of immigrants that came to Mexico, when they look back and they say, am I going to go back to Spain, which is now, you know, with a dictator and right. other mm -hmm. things, you know. So he decided to make his life in Mexico and he was appointed a uh, teacher at the National Conservatory. And he basically was the, the influence because his music was so well revered in Spain right. at the time that he actually influenced a lot of the modern Mexican composers. He was the, 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 the composition and harmony uh, professor at the conservatory, and he wrote a lot of his pieces, uh, his main pieces while living in Mexico. Unfortunately, because of his political views, you know, his music was kind of like, you know, it wasn't really hidden a little bit. It wasn't quite <laughs> totally embraced. Exactly. Exactly, but but he was, he's a fantastic composer. When you hear his music, it's, it's really nice. It's really amazing. What I loved about it, his music, it was that um, um, there's not a lot of it, but all of it is, is the craftsmanship is beautiful. They're really great pieces. I think his music is mostly tonal, but yet sometimes he spices it with these bold and sometimes kind of yes. witty dis dissonances. And in the 20th century, um, we had that uh, the music style, the 12-tone serial mm -hmm. system of composing, which is very complex and very um, sort of removed from the emotion of music. And he actually wrote a few pieces in that style. And he's the first uh, person from Mexico to ever write in the serial 12-tone um, yes. scale. And but um, that's kind of the outlier. He had a, you know, experimented with that, but mostly his music is very accessible. So almost anything you listen to of, of Hofstra, it's going to be something that I think you're going to connect with. Oh yeah, he, his music is super accessible, and, and as I said, he was a true artist. And, and uh, I don't know, I forgot to mention too that after the, the, the Spanish uh, refugees arrived in Mexico, uh, Mexico actually built the National Autonomous University to help house and, and give uh, work to all the professors of all these different uh, uh, walks of life that arrive in Mexico. It must have been, an, that's an interesting condo to be part of, the condo association <laughs> with all those folks. <laughs> you have all these incredibly talented, gifted people in really one place. And I imagine that created a lot of, of just vitality and excitement in that area. And I, I, his music is really lovely. I, I hope that you'll listen to some of those. Um, what uh, we, t we chose for you is a um, a little ballet suite, and it's from Baker in the Pre-Dawn Hours is how it translates. We also, uh, he wrote very little choral music, but there's a piece um, called Three Epitaphs, Three Short Little Pieces, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, and that's uh, really beautifully mm -hmm. sung, so we've got a recording of those on there yes. too, so yes. listen to those links. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's music that will reach you. <laughs> I think so, and uh, Jamal, I think you have number four. I do, Jose Pablo Moncayo. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, nailed oh, it. Oh, finally. Perfect. <laughs> so, a plus. <laughs> <laughs> so up front, I kind of need to ask for forgiveness because I, I am jumping around with this guy just because the more and more I was reading and listening, the more interesting things kind of, it's, it's amazing to see what's going on at the same time kind of thing. Um, Jose was born in Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. um, Moncayo showed musical talent at a young age and was first taught by an older brother and at age 17 was admitted to the National Conservatory. At conservatory he would have the opportunity to study with the likes of Carlos Chavez uh, and also studied theory and harmony with Jose Rolón. Jose Rolón. Uh, mm -hmm. Another important Mexican composer. Um, and finding out who Moncayo studied theory and harmony with was kind of intriguing to me. Um, and so I, I read a little bit about Rolon. Uh, Rolon had the opportunity to travel to France to study with one of the most influential female teachers and composers of the 20th century, Nadia Bolanger. 
1931, uh, Moncayo joined the Mexican Symphony Orchestra and from 19, as a percussionist, and from 1949 to 1954 held the position of conductor. Uh, Moncayo had many important partnerships with the Mexi with Mexican composers. I believe there's like a group of four they called themselves, something like that. Uh, it was him, Chavez, and two others. I can't think of who it was, but there was this four. There were four Mexican composers that were kind of networking together and had a relationship. There was well, a group of some number. The group yeah. of four, the group of six. There was the many others. Las Galindo. And yeah. There, there were many others. No, but uh, Jose Pablo Moncayo is. Uh, he was writing music at the time where, where in Mexico there was this nationalistic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mexico had a revolution from 1910 to till 1921 or something like that. I mean, it, it, it was brutal. So coming out of that, it was like, you know, they, 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 the country came into this nationalistic uh, uh, Vein and, and uh, you have the, the painters like Diego Rivera and Alfaro Siqueiros and all the murals that they that they painted. It was all about nationalistic themes, mm -hmm. and the composers were the same thing. And so that's where you see Revueltas and you see Jose Pablo Moncayo. Mm -hmm. And Jose Pablo Moncayo wrote this piece called the Huapango, mm -hmm. which uh, am amalgamates a lot of the folk tunes mm -hmm. from Mexico. And actually, in Mexico, after the national anthem, everybody knows the Wapango. It's like, yeah, like yeah. the second national anthem. <laughs> well, that was, one of the, that was definitely one of the things I found interesting about listening to his music and, and reading up about him, um, was just that he really brought the elements of nationalism and tradition um, to his music. Um, and sort of betraying the impressionistic traits and modal harmonies. Um, what was intriguing to know was his relationship with Aaron Copland um, and the fact that he got the opportunity to study composition with him. What I was most fascinated by was um, Copeland began what I would say an uneasy love affair with music, with Mexican music, uh, in the early to mid 1930s. His piece El Salón Mexico, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorite pieces. <laughs> I, I, I just love Copeland. Um, I I love this piece, and then all the stuff he writes. You know, is just I love America. After after I listen <laughs> to to Copeland, um, but he actually sent a letter to Chavez um, when he was wanting to write this. And, uh, and he says, I am terribly afraid of what you will say of the Salon Mexico. Perhaps it is not Mexican at all. Um, and I would feel so foolish. <laughs> um, but in America del Norte, it may sound Mexican. However, Chavez asked to conduct the piece once the orchestration was finished, and El Salon Mexico was premiered in Mexico City to great critical and popular acclaim, one critic stating that Copeland had composed Mexico, Mexican music, embodying the very elements of our folk song in the pursuit and most, in the purest and most perfect form. So, the the structure wapango right did i say that mm -hmm. right yeah very good. so uh, it's a cool piece just because it has to me a simple harmonic structure of going back between you know the major and minor and, and rhythmically going back between double and triple meters mm -hmm. um but why is this piece so important and widely popular. And can you kind of talk about the structure of the piece a little bit? Well, the Wapango actually, uh, Wapango is, 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 is actually comes from, from the region of the Veracruz, the, 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 the Gulf uh, region of Mexico. Uh, but that piece in itself has so many wonderful melodies from Mexico. And at the very end, there is this duel between the trumpet and the trombone mm -hmm. that it is pretty much like a, like a shouting match, like, you know, 
I can do it better than you. No, I can do it better <laughs> than you. You know, it's like it's very exciting. Yeah. And and at the end, it's just like very uplifting. And I think that's that's the part that that it's it's you know it just it's a it's a very positive and, and amazing piece. And that's what is beloved by by mm. everybody. And I would imagine too that they. I would imagine that if you're from Mexico, you hear those tunes and it's part of your heritage. Yes. It's, you know, it, you have a deep connection with that. Yes. And um, so he's an incredible, uh, incredible composer. And all the composers we've talked about are old dead guys. But we have one guy who's living <laughs> on our list, number five, Arturo Marquez. Arturo Marquez. And I'm telling you, my new favorite composer. <laughs> I, have, I have lost so much time for work this week because I listened to one piece by Marquez and I go, oh, going to listen to another one. Everything he writes, I think if he wrote Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, I'd be the first one to buy it. I love everything he's written. Um, I'm still learning a lot about him, but he is a living composer. He's popular among the Latin American public and is widely recognized as the most important Mexican composer of his generation. And he's still actively composing. Yes. Um, he had a premiere, uh, was going to do a premiere this summer uh, with uh, Gustavo Dudamel, uh, in the L.A. Phil of a piece called the Fantasy, um, Fandango Fantasy for Violin. And he just wrote that and didn't get a premiere because of COVID. Um, so he's really writing um, right up to the very day. Um, he was born in 1950, yeah. so he's uh, fairly young. He has a, was a son of a mariachi who also played the violin. His grandfather was a Mexican folk musician, so he was surrounded by, as Jamal was talking earlier, was surrounded by Mexican music from an early age. And then when he's 12, uh, his family moved to Los Angeles, uh, where he began studying the violin and other instruments and started to compose. And he said about his uh, early years, Mar Marquez says, my adolescence was spent listening to Javier Solis, Sounds of a Marachi, yeah. The Beatles, Doors, uh, Carlos Santana, and Chopin. So he, <laughs> so I think there that's you have it. He covered this. The everything, <laughs> all bases. <laughs> and uh, it was interesting with, with Marquez. He was he was mostly uh, unknown outside of his own country until the 90s, and he got um, really came to the prominence because of his uh, connection with Latin ballroom dancing and the movement and the rhythms led him to compose a series of these pulsating kind of danzones. Yeah. And um, the danzone is a fusion of dance music from the Veracruz region we just talked about, yes. and also Cuba. And his most popular one is the Danza, uh, Danza number two, hmm. and it thrills audiences. It's entrancing. It's seductive. Yes. It's se sensuous. It's everything. It was commissioned by the or the uh, National Autonomous University of, of Mexico that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they commissioned it, and because of its popularity, now see it says here that this is often called the second national anthem of Mexico. It has it has now so, come to par with so, the Wapango. All yes. right, so there's a two A wow. and a two B, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, these, he did a series of these, of which number two is the most famous and yes. well-known. But um, they're uh, more popular around the world now. There's a lot of ballet companies that have, have choreographed to them. Um, and um, he has just a lot of music. And so I encourage you, listen to that, the Danzon, you have to. Yeah. Uh, and then don't stop. Just keep listening. <laughs> yeah, um, Danzon number two is, is very melancholic. And, 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 you know, actually, I met Arturo Marquez. Remember when I was telling you about the National Youth yeah. Symphony in Mexico? Um, Arturo Marquez was married to the lady who, Lidia Tamayo, who won the harp. She was a harpist. Oh. And they were, they were married yeah. or they were There's a lot dating of beautiful or something like that. But music. that was the first time I met Arturo at that time. He must have been like 20. Oh something. my gosh. <laughs> he is just amazing. I, he's a, I, do you know the, the, the uh, Woodwind Quintet Danza? Del Medi That's Medio Del Medio Dia. Dia, yes. That is amazing. And then he wrote a piece for um, cello and orchestra that was written and recorded by the Mexican cellist um, Carlos uh, Prieto. Carlos Prieto. And that is, you know, I, we all heard these wonderful concertos, but I think this for cello, but this one is has its own sound world. It has its, it has this pulsating kind of rhythm to it. It has the, the just this sense of pathos and, and heartfelt. Mm -hmm. And then this other piece, which I, I played, I think, six times last night, and that's uh, Leyenda de Miliano. Miliano. Miliano, mm -hmm. and it was written in 2010. I'm telling you, everything he writes, I love. And I, uh, what struck me a lot this week, and, and Jamal and I have talked about in these kind of shows, we've really um, increased the breadth of knowledge of our um, knowledge of music and different styles. And you know, we started this project with you, Fernando, and I knew 
nobody at all. And now I know just a little scratch the surface. And when mm. you start to do that, you just discover so much um, of this music that is, it's an, it's, to me, it's like, um, how, can we, how can we only, only do Brahms and Tchaikovsky and, and uh, Rachmaninoff when we've got all these other composers we can put with that? Mm. And yeah. uh, I just, I, I, if, if nothing else, just lear learning Marquez has made my made my month so thank you oh wow well, it's been an honor and, and you know as i said there's so many more there's mm -hmm. you know mario la vista joaquin gutierrez Heras. i mean the list goes on and on and on and on and on and you know when when you when we talked about doing this i was like this would be a great opportunity for for people to get to know a little bit of, of where i come from mm -hmm. yeah you know? and then the listening guide i we encourage you on that listening guide to really um, take a look at that because it's just a good kind of uh, just you can jump in a little bit, put your toe in the water, see how it feels. Um, but there's some great music, and I think um, I kind of think sometimes you just I love to go down the YouTube rabbit hole, mm. and uh, <laughs> what'll happen is you'll you'll be in there for a couple things and keep keep going, keep discovering. And I think um, mm -hmm. the more we learn about this this music, then hopefully in American um, concerts, this music starts to find its way more than it has so far into our, into our concert halls and our, in our concert yeah. programming. We have a okay. question. Yes, we have a viewer who would like to know, what is the Sarasota Orchestra doing during COVID? Oh my gosh, that's a, that's a great question. That's a loaded question, question. yeah. The well, no, but it's a great <laughs> question. I, yeah, because it's, you know, people, many people have asked me that actually. Uh, you know, how are you guys doing? How's their, you know, and I have to say that the orchestra has been so nice because the orchestra uh, found the means to be able to keep all of us paid mm. until for this season. Right. Wow. You know, whether we're playing or not or until we can play or not, which is great because it's like we were really scared about what mm. we would happen. You know, we because, pay yeah, mortgages, no, and, and, yeah. you know, provincial. And we had friends in other orchestras, like um, in Nashville or in Indianapolis, you know, where basically they were furloughed for exactly. the whole year until September of uh -oh. next year with no paycheck and no health insurance. And uh, even the Metropolitan Opera, you know, exactly. has ceased operations until December or January, something like that, with uh -huh. no pay. Um, and you know the situation is, is dire for the arts. And I think in, in our community, um, at least the larger organizations, all of them have made that a priority. And I think that that lets you know, you know, sometimes your support is where your money is. And sure. you know, for all these organizations, the opera, the ballet, all of them, to really make that investment and to say that these these artists are who create our product and. Yeah you're important and it's not like you can just go um, say well, I'm gonna take my bassoon and Betsy your flute and we're gonna go play in a band tomorrow for a crowd of 30 people or 300 no it's not gonna happen yet so yeah so it's yeah. it's great that our organizations are really valuing um, the importance of, of what you guys bring to our community and so that when the time is to get together and start playing music again you guys are are financially able to survive this it actually intro. makes us even more when I was talking about even more eager to be able to go and start performing mm -hmm. for our audiences. I mean, it's like, I, I am so lucky to live in this place with, with such an amazing uh, community of, of uh, art lovers. And I'm excited. Our, our first time to work with you guys as an orchestra, Socially Distance, is going to be in January doing Bach Magnificat and Vivaldi mm -hmm. Gloria. So there's bassoon. So that's good. And flute for Betsy. So. <laughs> well, I, um, as we go today, I, I want to first say that uh, it's been a pleasure to have you oh, on the show you. and to get to, to know you more. Um, I think every time I have gone to a concert, um, I try and go out of my way to express gratitude for Fernando's playing. There is just... There's warmth, and you know, I've never really heard the bassoon speak. And you just, you give such voice to, oh. to your instrument. Absolutely. Um, and the, the, the two performances that just moved me to tears um, was Beethoven 9 um, and 
there's just nothing sexier than than bassoon playing Beethoven. Um, but also, having done Messiah with you at Church of the Palms, I just love listening to you, <laughs> to you play. Um, and so, today is exciting for all of us because oh, yeah. we get the opportunity um, to to hear Fernando play. And the reason you and Betsy are my favorite couple is because you both play my favorite instruments. So <laughs> can you tell us just a, a, a brief little bit about what we're gonna hear from you today? All right, uh, uh, you know, I'm thinking about music uh, from Mexican composers, you know, there's maybe a couple of pieces that were written for the bassoon and they are contemporary and I just did not want to in the program like that, sure, because they are very long and you know complex. Uh, so instead, I chose a piece that was originally written as a violin etude hmm. by the Mexican composer Nicolas Oliveri, and he was born in the 1600s again, and he wrote in the Baroque style, and he became the Kapellmeister of the mm -hmm. cathedral, right. you know, and and also he taught music. In a in a girls' uh, college, just like Vivaldi, just like Vivaldi, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, El Colegio de San Belén in, in Mexico City, and so uh, these um, these pieces are actually part of a larger like sort of method for violin, mm -hmm. and they're actually very nice. So I I, I uh, arrange one for bassoon, and then that's what we're gonna hear, and then I hope that you know. <laughs> Don't let me know if there are any complaints, but <laughs> well, you know, uh, we, we appreciate it because it's we've uh, we've you're our first ever guest and our first ever performance, yeah. so we're excited. So here is Fernando Traba. Lesson number one for solo bassoon by Nicholas Alavari, and uh, I have to say, now you know why we love him. <laughs> he has a great story, he's a great musician, and we want to thank Fernando for sharing uh, his incredible story and for playing for us too. And I know we've all learned so much about classical music of Mexico, and we couldn't have done it so beautifully without you, Fernando. So, Fernando, thank you so much for joining us today. We thank really you so much. So Joe. appreciate it. Thank I'd you, say Joe. I think as the show progressed, we both got better in pronunciating these. I think so. These That's names right. And titles. So we I, need to <laughs> we need to plan a trip to Mexico now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, we want to thank all of you for joining us in in this conversation. Um, as you can see, this is, this is the outreach that we, we love to do in the community. And so we definitely would ask if you, if you would just give a financial gift to us to help us to continue doing the great work of community outreach and just bringing music and special and wonderful people like Fernando um, to the community. And remember, if you're catching us for the first time, you can always check us out. Our other episodes are on, you, on our YouTube channel anytime after the premiere. If you enjoy these conversations, please help spread the word and let your friends know and family know about morning coffee. And my throats. We are very excited about our next time on 
morning coffee. And maestros. I don't have that deep, rich voice that you do. <laughs> Our next time, we'll be talking to, uh, with my Jet City maestro and maestro friend, Mark, today. Uh, Mark is the music director of New Zealand's Orchestra Wellington and California's Vallejo Symphony Orchestra. And he joins us in a program that we're calling Worlds Apart. When it comes to battling the pandemic with concerts in full swing with full houses in New Zealand, while most of America's performing arts are dark, New Zealand and the United States are worlds apart. But while we may be 8,000 miles apart, part, Mark has a close connection with Sarasota as his parents have been residents for many years. See what happens when you add yet another maestro to the mix. I think that could be dangerous. I'm sure it will be. I think. I wonder if he had what he thinks about Haydn, does he have say? He may not have the same disdain that you do for Haydn. I mean, he probably will just assume like everybody else.